The Right Reverend Samuel Johnston Howard has been Bishop of the Diocese of Florida for 12 years now. And um, Trinity just enjoyed doing the Lenten series that you and uh, David Crabtree uh, put together. And we really enjoyed it on the Book of Revelation. Thank you for doing that. Doug Walker is with Bishop Howard for tonight's presentation. And Doug is the Bishop's Deputy for Advancement and Stewardship and Executive Director of the Diocese Diocesan Foundation. So glad you're here with us also. Thank you so much for that introduction. And it is good to be here with you all tonight and to be among uh, among so many good friends and uh, to be in a place that, uh, that I love so much. Uh, the uh, night before Marie and I rode over to um, Camp Weed, for what is kind of cleverly called the walkabout. That's when they get all the candidates for bishop in the diocese together in one place to answer questions from people all over the diocese. And in our case, it was a, it's what seemed like about a 72 hour day <laughs> over at Camp Weed. Uh, and it's, it, it, it's a difficult ordeal. But we were smart, at least Marie Howard was smart, always has been. She chose it very well when it came to husbands. Uh, <laughs> but she wanted to come. She said, we, we're probably, you're probably not going to be selected to be the bishop. We'll probably never be back in that part of Florida again. <laughs> I've always wanted to see St. Augustine. And so the night before the walkabout, we came to St. Augustine. And just, just tonight, we were sort of talking about it. We stayed at a little B&B &B over here somewhere. And I, I, I wonder if you would recognize it if you did see it. But, but we had a lovely evening and, uh, and then traveled over to uh, uh, St. Augustine, uh, over to Camp Weed, where the, uh, where, where the real fun began. Not, not really. I wish we could have stayed in St. Augustine. But all of, my, all of my trips to this place over the years have been uh, delightful and fun. But more importantly than that, the ministry that I share with each of you and with your clergy has been meaningful and deep and rich. And from the very first, I learned that uh, this was a parish with a vision. And the vision had to do at that time with expansion of ministry, with the future. It had to do with, with a lot of the things that we're talking about right now in the diocese. It had to do with ministry to uh, all different segments of the population, growth of our church, uh, bringing more and more people to know and love God through Jesus Christ, His Son, our Lord. And uh, we're privileged now to sit in Exhibit A for that kind of vision. I hope you all realize the leadership, the quality of leadership you have had here over the years and what this is producing both now and for future generations in the church. Uh, I talked to uh, my good friend David Widener, and he tells me the sorts of resources that, that your ownership of this block is going to make in the life of the church in the years to come. And it's just, uh, it, it's astounding that God would bless a parish with those kinds of resources while at the same time making this kind of uh, of a, of a facility available to us. So, Marie and I are delighted to be with you here tonight. Uh, good to have our colleague and friend Doug Walker with us. Good to be with uh, all of you and to have a chance to talk a little bit about uh, life in the diocese. Uh, before I get into a discussion of that, uh, let us pray. Gracious God, we give you our praise and thanks for this day, for this evening, for the food we've had, the friendship that we're surrounded by, the good visits and conversations we've had this evening. We thank you for this church, for Trinity Parish, for its leaders, its members, and for the uh, wonderful things that it is doing in the life of this community and of its members and of the families uh, represented here. Uh, be with us now, Lord, as we meet and as we talk about our lives together, our ministries, and the good things to which you have called us. Bless this time together. 
and by your mercy, Lord, help us to catch at least a glimpse of your will for our lives and for your church. And all of this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, I, I want to uh, <clears throat> divide these comments up into a, a couple of different parts. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about some things that we have been working on in the Diocese of Florida for the last uh, four or five years. And then uh, Doug Walker's been kind enough to bring a film clip that I hope isn't too long for you, a portion of an address that I gave to our diocesan convention in January, where I, I started a discussion talking about the next chapter for the Diocese of Florida. And then I want to come back up just to summarize some of that and then to answer any questions you might have. I, I don't mean to make this too long an evening for you, and, uh, and if it gets to be that way, I, I recognize certain universal symbols that my wife has taught me over the years <laughs> that start with this, <laughs> and then and then gradually move to this. Uh, I, can, I can limit my time, and I have, a, you, you know the, uh, uh, the story about the, the little Episcopalian boy who brought his little Baptist friend to church with him. And, uh, and as they're going through the service, the little Episcopalian boy is trying to explain everything to the little Baptist boy about why we're standing, why we're sitting, why we're kneeling, why we're doing. And finally it comes time for the, for the sermon. And the, uh, and the rector gets up and comes to the pulpit and first thing that he does is he puts his he puts his prayer book right on the edge of the pulpit and, and it's open to a certain page. And the Episcopalian boy said, that's a, that's a good sign. It means that he knows the hymn we're going to sing right after the sermon and it's going to be related to the scripture that he's going to preach on. So they sort of nodded that. He said, then the preacher pulls out his note cards and puts them in an array on top of the pulpit. And the little Episcopalian boy said, oh, that's a very good sign. It means he's prepared this one. He actually, he actually wrote a sermon for the day. And then the next thing that the, uh, that the rector did was to take his watch off and put it on the pulpit. And the little Baptist boy said, now, what does that mean? And the little Episcopalian boy said, not a darn thing. <laughs> <laughs> this does mean something. About five years ago, um, uh, we, we began a project in the diocese of, of reforming and reforming uh, our diocesan foundation. It had been in existence since the 1990s, but over the last uh, seven, eight, ten years before we started that project, it had kind of waned in terms of importance and activity, didn't quite know what its mission was, and there had been a lot of flux and back and forth in membership of the board and so forth. But uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to persuade Doug Walker to come to the staff of your diocese from uh, what was still then Episcopal High School in Jacksonville, now the Episcopal School of Jacksonville, where he had been their director of advancement and persuaded him to work with us uh, in our diocese on the same sorts of issues, providing resources for ministry. And with Doug's uh, uh, able assistance and leadership, uh, we we, we really amended the charter, the bylaws of the Diocesan Foundation, gave it a distinctive mission, which had to do with providing leadership for the church, and then we, we put in place a, a new foundation board. And that foundation board consisted of, of five really fine Episcopalians, leaders in the community, leaders especially in the business world, uh, and men and women who were able to help us uh, garner the resources for ministry over the next decade. Uh, Tom Petway, uh, a, a, a Jacksonville businessman, was appointed the first chairman of, of the new foundation board and other members included uh, uh, John Baker, uh, Joni Newton, uh, and Jim Winston, and shortly after that, uh, former Ambassador John Rood was, a, was, a, was appointed to the board. Uh, Tom Petway has now stepped down as chairman of the board. He's an, an emeritus uh, chairman, still sits with the board, but now uh, John Baker uh, has uh, taken the reins of, uh, of the chairmanship of that foundation board, and Doug 
uh, Walker continues to serve very ably uh, and wisely, I might add, as its um, uh, uh, executive director. Over the last five years, that, uh, that foundation board uh, has led in the leadership of over $11 million in gifts and pledges to the diocese. Uh, we have, uh, uh, in, the, in those years, the last three years or so, we have spent of that amount about $3 million directly on uh, diocesan ministry in the diocese. The foundation board set out with, uh, with a, a mantra, which was music to a priest's ears. Priests are always being told, no, you can't do this, you can't do that. Foundation board said, we can do just about anything we want to do. We just can't do everything we want to do, at least not all at once. But they didn't want to accumulate a large corpus of money. They didn't want to uh, increase the diocesan endowment, which is a relatively small uh, endowment for a diocese this size. What they wanted to do was to raise money to carry out a vision for ministry in the Diocese of Florida. And so the gifts that are made are actually spent on, on ministry. The money that we have in the bank is invested very wisely with a board like that. They know the best investment people and take good care of it. A big part of Doug's job is, is tending to that. But they wanted to make sure that we moved ahead with ministry in order to grow those things that are important in the diocese for sharing the gospel and in order to bring more and more people to know and love God. Here's some of the things that, that we've worked on and had some real uh, success with. We have been uh, able to, over the last three years now, provide clergy support in some parishes and missions that could not otherwise afford it. And we look particularly for parishes that have a plan, parishes that know where they're headed in terms of ministry, that, that are growing, that know how to handle new members and visitors, and integrate them into the life of the parish, and, and, and parishes that are in what I like to call a real mission mode and not just a maintenance mode. In other words, the foundation is not, not paying babysitters with collars to go into parishes. We're looking for folks like David Widener, Ken Herzog, who know how to build and grow membership and program and affect the lives of more and more people in our communities through ministry. So number one, we're, we're helping to provide clergy in some places that couldn't otherwise afford it. We've, we've worked on our college chaplaincies, um, ex the existing ones at the University of Florida and at FSU, and a, uh, and a new one that's uh, started just in the last year at the University of, of North Florida. We have something that's really near and dear to my heart. We have created what we're calling the Bishop's Institute for Ministry and Leadership, which is working to help train all of us in our ministry. We've had seminars for preachers attended by some of our priests and our clergy. We've had a long weekend program on C.S. Lewis that some of you may have attended. Anybody here at the C.S. Lewis program last fall? Well, my wife was. Um, <laughs> tell you the, the guy who gave it. His name is Earl Palmer. He's a Presbyterian minister from uh, Seattle, Washington. Uh, probably one of the dozen greatest preachers in America. But he's also uh, an internationally recognized expert on C.S. Lewis. He leads summer programs at Lewis's home in Oxford, England every summer for groups that come there. And there's a long waiting list to go there with, uh, with uh, Dr. Palmer. Get your calendars out figuratively if not literally. Earl Palmer is going to be back this coming fall in September. Sign up for it. Come. You will be amazed by what you learn. His program this year is going to be on the great uh, 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 German preacher and martyr Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Mm -hmm. And that will be a really outstanding weekend. I, I'll just give you one small witness about how good the program on uh, C.S. Lewis was. It was the, we started uh, noonish on Friday, and we're going to run through the middle of the day Sunday. But Friday, Saturday morning, I'm standing over at uh, Camp Weed on the porch having a cup of coffee, and, and this uh, man about my age comes over to me to introduce himself, and we're drinking our coffee, and he says, "You know, I only signed up for yesterday, 
But I went back in this morning and told them that I wanted to sign up for the rest of the weekend. I said, well, that's good. I'm, I'm glad that uh, glad that it's having that kind of an impact on you and it's that meaningful. He said, no, no, you don't understand. I had box seats at the Georgia-Florida game. Wow. I said, oh, it's that good, is it? So, if that's some indication to you, that, that's the kind of thing that, a, that an SEC fan can really understand. That's a little uh, but but there, there are more programs too. We've had programs on church music. We've had theology programs for the uh, for the clergy, as well as just this past weekend sponsoring and and being able to again thanks to your foundation to pay for a weekend of spiritual uh, discipline talks and prayer for our college students. Mm -hmm. For our college students now from all three universities where we have chaplains, East Florida. Florida State and UNF, there were, do you remember how many, Doug? About 30, or so. About 30 or so of our college students coming to spend a weekend, right before exams, I might add. Maybe, well, maybe that was an inducement. <laughs> Come away and pray before exams. <laughs> but uh, it was a good weekend. It was led by a, a, a Catholic, a lay Cistercian uh, monk from up in, in Atlanta, from the uh, Atlanta area, from a monastery up there whom I have heard lecture before, and he's very solid and theologically straight, uh, but he knows how to engage those young people and get them involved in it, which is an important part of all of our ministry. <coughs> um, along the way, in addition to that Bishop's Institute for Ministry and Leadership, uh, we've, we've done a lot of deferred maintenance things and improved uh, uh, Camp Weed and the Serbian Conference Center immensely. If you have the opportunity to be there for an event or a retreat or to attend anything in the near future, I think you'll begin to notice a difference in the atmosphere. I think the hospitality is, is, is excellent. The food's getting better and better. And uh, uh, every comment that I hear about what we've been able to do at that place has been very positive. One more thing that we've done, which is especially in, in, important for those of us who are worried about uh, our message getting out to the world is the um, uh, great improvement in diocesan communications. We all knew and loved the old newspaper that Virginia Barker put out for so many years, the diocesan. Kind of moved on from paper these days. Well, most people have, not me. I still like paper more than I like computers. And you may agree with me on, on that, but most of the world's re getting their news off the computer, believe it or not, and so is so this diocese. So we have now two or three different iterations of diocesan communications, weekly, monthly, longer term, and sort of the crowning glory of it, I think, is a magazine, still named the Diocesan, but now a lovely color publication that comes out several times a year, and hopefully even more in the future, that regularly focuses on aspects of ministry and people in our diocese and what's going on among us as far as uh, and as sharing the gospel is concerned. Here's the important thing. Here's the important thing about everything that I've just shared with you. It is that we have, with the assistance of the foundation board, those who have given so generously already and helped us raise those $11 million that we have so far, begun to move our diocese away from maintenance and towards mission. We're not here just to exist in the world. We are here to change the world. And we are here to claim our small corner of the world for Jesus Christ. Yes. We are here. We are here to preach the gospel. We're here to remind people of their need of God's love, mercy, grace, and forgiveness. And we're here to introduce those who have never heard the name of Jesus or never thought very seriously about him to him. And that's what we're about as a church. And that's what the foundation's work is about. It's what my ministry is about, even as it is what the ministry of this parish is about. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to be able to give you that kind of report uh, tonight. Now, we're going to see a few minutes uh, of my convention address, Doug has selected one thing that, uh, one, one part of that speech that has to do in particular 
with the issues of church growth and obedience to the Great Commission. Remember the Great Commission? What did Jesus say? It was, it was the resurrected Lord who said it. He said, go into all the world baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And in other words, go to them and preach and teach and bring them into the flock because your job as a Christian is to create still more Christians. So let's, uh, let's hear just a few minutes of that convention address and then I'll make a few closing co comments and, and answer any questions or hear any comments you might want to offer. Calling us, those of us in this room right now, those in the congregations we represent, our families, our friends, our neighbors, our, our churches across the diocese. What is God calling us to do in this next stage of our life together? Well, I began these remarks with three bits of scripture. In one, Christ claimed his anointed, his anointing as God's chosen one, and describes what his ministry will be. In another, St. Paul details our call to a ministry as ambassadors for Christ, picking up, in effect, the ministry of Christ and carrying it on. And then there's that third piece of scripture to which I referred, spoken by the resurrected Lord. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Dear friends, brothers and sisters, that is the Great Commission, and those are the words we will address today. I believe that God is calling us in this diocese to enter into a new season of growth, a new season of growth, a time in which we will self-consciously, intentionally, and actively turn our attention, all of our attention, every individual, every parish, every mission, the diocesan staff, all of our attention to fulfilling the Great Commission. As a thriving and spirit-led diocese, our vision cannot be one of maintenance, which leads to stagnation. It must be one of growth, it must be one of mission, and our mission must be clear, to win our portion of the world for Christ. In the year to come, we as a diocese are going to thoughtfully, prayerfully, and deliberately frame a bold vision for evangelism, a bold vision for congregational development, and a bold vision for generous Christian giving. I intend to take part in framing that vision, but it is not mine alone to create. In this important endeavor, we will need the collective wisdom of our whole church, and our entire diocese. We will need the special skills of those who are gifted in congregational development. We will need the energy and fresh ideas of our young people, and we will need steady and insightful leadership. For all those reasons, I am today establishing a Blue Ribbon Commission on congregational development, church growth, and Christian giving in the Episcopal Diocese of Florida. And I'm delighted to announce that the commission will be co-chaired by two individuals well known to you and to all of our diocese. John Baker, devoted and faithful layperson, businessman, and currently the chairman of our diocese and foundation will be one of those leaders. And the other will be Rick Westbury, rector of our diocese's largest parish and active always in church affairs and leadership. Having agreed to lead our vision forming work, John and Rick will soon form a panel of additional lay and clergy leaders to convene a process of vision, growth, 
development, and generosity. Under the aegis of that commission, we'll have a number of task forces and working groups. They may include groups working on issues such as what should Christian evangelism in the Anglican and Episcopalian tradition of North Florida look like over the next decade? Where do we need to plant new churches in order to reach the unchurched and to serve those who are hungry for worship in our tradition? What do we need to do in order to find and help discern the ministries and deploy clergy who are gifted at and focused on congregational growth, development, and giving? How do we leverage the energy and enthusiasm of our young people to increase their involvement in the life of our church and to reach out to those who are not already ours and may be unchurched? How do we grow our numbers in non-traditional settings such as prisons, hospitals, chaplaincies? How do we encourage our members to participate in small groups and Bible studies to foster Christian fellowship and to draw still more people to know and love Christ? What will the role of our renewal programs, Curcio, Happening, and others, be as we seek increased church growth? And how can we use them as a gateway to membership? How can we best share the gospel in rural communities, in the center of our cities, in our schools and colleges? What will be the future of our Hispanic ministries? How can we effectively restart some of the parishes that have faltered in the last 10 years? Not propping up institutional failure, but always being sensitive to the Holy Spirit's guidance toward renewal and growth. How can we best utilize existing evangelical projects such as the Bishop's Institute to support Christian formation and congregational growth? And what should be done to encourage all of us to give more generously in response to God's love and in obedience to the Great Commission. I ask you today and I will ask the members of our Blue Ribbon Commission and of their subcommittees and working groups to agree with me on the following goals. Over the next five years, we will grow in attendance and membership in this diocese by 30%. In the next five years, we will plant at least one new church in each region of our diocese. 30% and five new churches. All of that 30% may not be the freshly scrubbed faces from the 1950s that many of us knew growing up. All of those churches may not look exactly like the ones that we went to as children, but brothers and sisters, we can do it, we're called to do it, and we're going to do it. 30%. Thirty percent and five new churches. I had a couple of conversations with some of our clergy yesterday, and I was sort of testing some of these ideas. I said, we'll talk about church growth tomorrow, I think. I've sort of been and both of these rectors to whom I spoke are from small churches in the diocese, small churches. And Sort of isolated areas, not real close to other churches, not close to big cities at all. And both of them volunteered the following. One said, 
you know, since I've come to this church where I'm serving now, it's been amazing to watch new people come in the door. We're up by 30%. Now, that's 30% of not many, but it's 30%. I said, what are you doing that's different? What's changing? He said, I'm just preaching. I'm just teaching. I'm talking about Jesus. The other, the other rector I spoke to, very, very similar conversation. 6% in the last year. Well, add it up. 6% in a small parish. Multiply that by five for the next five years. There's your 30%. And every one of us can do it in every one of our congregations, and we're going to do it. We're going to do it. Well, it is, uh, it is our next chapter. Uh, we've got the pieces in place in this diocese, strong youth program, one that's becoming more and more recognized across the province, four, four, which really is the Episcopal Church in the Southeast United States, and some of us would say really is the Episcopal Church, period. Yeah. Our youth program is being recognized as one of the very best. And uh, our college ministries are strong. We're weak right now in terms of our ministry to older people. Uh, Marie was just pointing to me last night and saying, I think we need to get more Nazis in ministry to people your age, John. And so we're going to be, be working on that over, over the next year or two. But in so many ways, with our camp and conference center in good shape, with our uh, Bishop's Institute as strong and lively as it is. And by the way, have I mentioned Douglas Dupree to you? If you don't know Douglas Dupree, you're in for a treat. Douglas is a priest who originally came from this diocese. He was... He was ordained by Bishop West. Anybody remember Bishop West? A few of you do. Uh, and uh, and uh, attended uh, Virginia Seminary after graduating from Sewanee. Then he went to Oxford University to get a PhD and never came back. Or at least not for the first 30 years he didn't come back. He, he became the dean and the chaplain of Balliol College at Oxford. And when he retired from there last year, he came back to Florida. And he's the head of our Bishop's Institute. A man, um, product of this diocese with strong academic credentials, uh, well known among theologians and in international circles, helping us get the very best teachers, and a delightful man uh, as well, one whom I know you will enjoy getting to know. So we're going to we're going to achieve these goals. I'm confident that we are. Uh, John Baker and Rick Westbury are hard at work having meetings with clergy. Have they been to this region yet for a meeting with you all? You're on the list, though, and they'll be contacting you soon. And then there'll be some meetings with lay people as well. And if we can stay on mission, if we can focus on the abundance that God has blessed us with, if we can focus on the fact that God wants us to be growing and healthy as a diocese, as a diocese then we will achieve these goals. Two or three years ago, the last year that I have um, any figures on, they did a, a survey of all the dioceses in the Episcopal Church. There are about, about 100 dioceses. And Florida's kind of in the middle third in terms of size. Uh, not the biggest, not the smallest. Uh, we have a nice balance of urban and rural churches. Um, some large and growing, like Trinity Church, some small and, and uh, feeling their, their way, like certain parishes I could mention, even in this region. But three years ago, the last figures that I saw showed that the Diocese of Florida was one of only ten dioceses in the Episcopal Church that was growing. We weren't growing by much, but we were growing. Most of our church right now is accepting decreased membership, failing ministry, and eventual extinction as reality. And that's not where you and I are headed. That's not where Jesus Christ wants to lead us, and that's not where the Holy Spirit is going to take us. 
And one reason for that is we're going to stay focused on the Lord. Let me just close with, uh, with some remarks that C.S. Lewis made about 70 years ago now in an essay that he called Mere Christianity. He said that whenever your Christianity becomes linked to another cause, so that, and the ones he mentioned in his essay, he was kind of being funny, it was back in the 1940s. He said, uh, he said so that it becomes not just Christianity, but becomes Christianity and vegetarianism. <laughs> and one, he was poking fun at his good friend J.R.R. Tolkien, you know, who wrote the, um, you know, the Lord of the He said, or Christianity and spelling reform. <laughs> but I would say in our time, Christianity and global warming. Right. I would say Christianity and human sexuality. Lewis said, you don't do that. That's the mark of a failing ministry. It must be mere Christianity. Christianity only. You care about your other issues, work hard to achieve them. Those that are secular, keep them in the secular realm. Those that are spiritual, see what Christ has to say about them. But mere Christianity is going to be our key. We're going to proclaim the Lord and Him crucified. And in doing that, he is going to bless us, and we are going to grow, and we are going to be stronger, and make a bigger difference in the lives of our families, our friends, our neighbors, our communities, than ever before. God bless you all. Thank you for having us as your guests this evening. Let me, uh, thank you. Very much.